moving forward. Um, this is not the first time that Yorktown has been observed. Uh, it was found um, previously, and now we are getting uh, more footage with our ROV Atalanta. We're conducting the survey with tow sled Atalanta, and so to move Atalanta around, cautiously around the USS Yorktown, we use the ship movements some 5,100 meters above the uh, ROV. So that allows us to do a very slow, in. cautious survey. It takes some time to maneuver, but we want to make sure we don't entangle the cable or the ROV or contact the ship at all. Right. We are really uh, grateful for our navigator and ROV pilots for doing such a great job. Oh yeah, he did. But he uh, seemed to be drifting south now. And earlier we were looking at how um, some, uh, I believe, anti-aircraft guns were jettisoned from the side of the boat in an attempt to correct the list. Um, just wondering also, uh, what other options are there if a ship is, uh, I believe, taking on water and developing a list, what can the crew do to fix that situation? Would any of the archaeological team be able to help answer that? Well, we could try. I mean, one thing you can do is is counter flooding to try to, to level yeah, the ship 20 out. 20 meters. But uh, um, that's, zero that's seven more zero. of an operational <laughs> historical question than mm. an archaeological <laughs> one, gotcha. I'm afraid. I mean, just stop stop the leaking, you know, stop the water coming in. Right. Seal the, the watertight doors, watertight bulkheads, mm -hmm. counter flood to try to stabilize the vessel. Pump the water out. That's another main thing to do is get, get water pumps on board. Zero pump seven zero. Out. Right. Correct. Yeah, that um, 10 meters at uh, 105. Did not, uh, didn't do anything. But he, sl he slid 10 meters to the south there, I think is what happened. And I believe part of the reason why uh, dives like this and why archaeology can be so uh, valuable and important is because it can help show physical evidence of, you know, what kind of damage um, caused the ship to sink, what events led up to that, especially when maybe there were not really witnesses to the event. Um, are there uh, maybe books or other resources from um, first-hand accounts, Hans, that people can look into if they want to read more about what happened? Yeah, I think this is one of the more studied battles in history, and so there are a number of excellent references out there by military historians 
that incorporate, you know, first-hand observations, battle reports, after-action reports, etc. Um, I will say that as I grew more familiar with studying the, the history and archaeology of World War II in the Pacific, the nice thing about doing that type of work is that navies run on paperwork, so there's going to be records of a lot of things, uh. you know, kept at National Archives. These are federal records, so the the primary information is voluminous as compared to commercial vessels or private mm -hmm. craft that, mm -hmm. that may sink. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm sure all our colleagues at the command center on shore mm -hmm. know quite a bit about this battle and the references that have been written, if not, if they haven't written those, those, those types of things themselves. All right. So there's plenty of information for folks to look at that's reliable information they can find. Nav, are we moving back towards the wreck? In theory. Mm. Yeah, it's just taking a while for Atalanta. Okay. Hans, one of the things I think we would mention is that the in the span of, say, your life and mine, we've witnessed the aging of the generation that fought in this war, and both of us grew up, as many others did, knowing these people, they are our parents, our uncles, our aunts, um, grandparents, and they found themselves caught up in a global conflict in all of these, these countries, in our own and elsewhere, and many of them did not come home. Others did, and I think for me in particular as an archaeologist who works on this, uh, the interest started when it was not considered historic, but something that had happened more recently. It was something that, in some cases, veterans would not talk about at all. And it only came in later years. And I specifically recall the 50th anniversary of Pearl Harbor as a moment where, all of a sudden, you know, veterans are meeting and there was worry. I was part of the, the National Park Service group that was helping plan that. And the discussion was, participation by Japanese veterans. Here's, here's two groups that 50 years ago had fought in a very difficult battle with great loss of life. And watching those old men approach each other and remember that they'd once been young and caught up in something bigger than themselves and gone off to war and that they'd all lost friends. Uh, watching them compare stories, seeing them relive moments, where they'd once been shooting at each other and laughing and smiling. It not only gave, I think, a, a powerful moment for all of us who watched that and at subsequent reunions, a sense that, that time not only heals wounds, but that there is a sense that oftentimes gets lost in the moment and in the fog of war of that which actually is common. But there's also a sense that there's times when events happen, when nations are taken over by an ideology, as Japan, Germany, and Italy had been, where the rest of the world needed to confront that. And so seeing all of that pass and then seeing all of these, these guys together and now realizing that there's only a few of them, of all that I knew, very few of them left. The, the Japanese veterans I knew, the couple of German veterans I knew, the many American veterans I knew, including, you know, my own grandparents. Uh, here we are now, coming up just 80 years later, and this, this history is really passing out of living memory. But it still exists down there, and in the kind of conditions that we're seeing now on the bottom, with this, this vessel so seemingly wrecked, but also so well-preserved with paint still on it and with battle scars still there. And it's every moment you turn, as we've said previously in the discussion, frozen moments in time. That's, that for me is something that speaks powerfully as well as the books. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And again, for anyone just tuning in now, we have our team inside the control van on Nautilus, but we also have an amazing dedicated team of 
um, scientists ashore that are offering their um, expertise and thoughts at the same time. Uh, if you liked more information again, please check out our webpage. All our uh, current watch and scientists ashore uh, have profiles that you can learn more about their work. Yeah, for our team in the ECC, um, good morning, later in the morning, coming up on 7.30 for you all there. Uh, oh no, that's not right, 8.30, it's 2.30 in the morning here on Nautilus. Um, how are you all doing, and could we get another round of reintroductions for who's there? Sure, yeah, so... Uh, once again, my name's Kara. I'm the Science Communication Fellow, um, trying to help uh, share this information with our global audience. I'll pass it on to uh, my right. I think you're not like on SPL. Airplane target Sorry. right there. Hi there. Sorry. About that. <laughs> Where's it at? Ali and good morning. My name is Elsie and I'm from Palau. And um, I'm no, here as away. a it's supporting scientist. About 30 meters away. Uh, on the 12 to 4 watch. And um, honored and it's humbled to be here no. um, exploring the USS Yorktown with everybody and everybody watching ashore. And I'll pass it on to, um, to my right. Good morning, uh, I'm Upashana. I am uh, the biologist of the 12 to 4 watch and today I'm here, it's an honor to be a part of this team and uh, part of this expedition and learning so much about the Battle of Midway and uh, the whole history from the archaeologists and the team and uh, I will pass it on to Hans. Good morning all. I'm Hans van Tilburg, a maritime archaeologist with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. I'm here as the NOAA sanctuary archaeologist, um, working collaboratively yeah, with our, our Ocean Exploration Office and with Mike Brennan, who is the chief archaeological lead. He stepped out for a moment, so he'll he'll say hello when he comes back in. <coughs> Taylor on. Hello, my name is Taylor Ann. I am a research assistant at UCLA and a science manager here aboard Nautilus. And I am the data logger on this watch, logging all observations of what we're seeing here on this archaeological adventure um, through time, back in history. Um, and yeah, just taking screen grabs of everything um, and identifying the biology that we're seeing. Um, and this right here is a uh, sea cucumber that we're seeing in the middle of the, the screen right now. I'm very honored to be here as well. Thank you, Taylor Ann. Um, and then heading to our front row, uh, Jaina, could you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Aloha, my name is Jaina Galvez. I am originally from Hilo, Hawaii. I now reside in Seattle, Washington, and I am here as the video engineer. And I'll pass it on to my right. My name is Jacob Westman. I'm from Ever Beach on Oahu. And I'm a ROV intern. I guess that's me. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Dan, part of the ROV time. ROV team. Very grateful to be sitting up here uh, waiting for a vessel move. Are we there yet, Mia? Hi, I'm Mia. I'm serving as a navigator on this um, cruise, and I've been learning a lot from Dan. It's my first time serving as a navigator, but second time aboard Nautilus. Awesome. And uh, Megan, I'd actually like to toss it back to you um, if you'd like a chance to introduce yourself as well. We're still uh, we're still moving closer, so yeah. I think we got a little greedy there on the 
Yeah. Uh, it looks like actually well, no, Megan might have stepped out move. for a second. So the reason um, it basically took us 215 and it, we kept swinging 20 meters after uh, we stopped moving. So Could our uh, team of scientists ashore uh, reintroduce yourself Tens again for any new viewers joining us? Yeah, uh, greetings everybody from NOAA's Exploration Command Center. My name is Phil Hartmeyer. I'm serving as a co-lead scientist ashore. Um, I'm the marine archaeologist for NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research and joined here by, uh, by several others. Hi, this is Jim Delgado. I'm the other co-lead archaeologist ashore with our colleagues both here in the Exploration Command Center and those that are joining us via satellite link from uh, elsewhere around the country and indeed around the globe. Uh, I'm Senior Vice President of Search Incorporated, largest archaeology company in the United States, but previously was with NOAA and other organizations uh, dealing with the archaeology of lost ships, particularly warships. It's a pleasure to now turn this over to my colleagues from the Navy History and Heritage Command. Hello, my name is Alexis Kimbis. Uh, I head the uh, Naval History and Heritage Command's Underwater Archaeology Branch. Uh, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be part of this uh, mission. Uh, our office manages the Navy ship and aircraft wrecks uh, wherever they may lie, and so this is a great opportunity to document one of the uh, most important ships in the uh, Navy's history. And I'm Frank Thompson. I'm the Acting Assistant Director for Collection Management, which uh, for Naval History and Heritage Command, of which the Underwater Archaeology Branch is part of. 10 meters, 075. The uh, pleasure of uh, participating in a dive on Midway wreck back in 2019. So this is an honor to be part of the Yorktown again after 1998 uh, survey done by Bob Ballard. And we're happy to be part of this, uh, this evolution. We also know that we have other colleagues who are calling in and observing from shore, including Russ Matthews from the RC Heritage Foundation, who's working as an expert on the aircraft that these vessels carried and that which possibly we may encounter. Akefume uh, Iwabuchi, Jun Kimura, Randall Sasaki from Japan, Megan Licklider Munden from the Defense POW MIA Accounting Command. And a Fleming from DPA as well, uh, and other colleagues from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, uh, most likely Bert Ho and uh, Geneva Wright also phoning in, and others uh, yet to be named. For all of you out there, one of the ways that this works brilliantly is, as Dr. Ballard had intended, telepresence not only links us to the ship and to the action as it happens, but it also links you, everybody out there in the public but it also allows for us to collaborate and work with a team of scientists uh, not really accessible to one another given the crowded space on a ship. In this case, we have close to, what I said, about 90 scientists ashore participating in this. Yeah, so thrilled and grateful for the experience, expertise of the whole team. Um, this is Megan Cook, the co-expedition leader of the Ala Moana Kai'uli expedition, and uh, none of this would be possible without the type of collaboration we're seeing interinstitution, international, um, and we're so um, honored, humbled that people around the world want to be part of this story and are curious about our oceans and about it, their history. So thank you all for joining us um, in all the roles that you contribute, um, being an explorer on Nautilus Live, sharing our content on social media. If you have friends who'd love this dive uh, and you're over on YouTube or you're watching on Nautilus Live, please uh, go ahead and check out our social channels and share them out, uh, the news there. We, a little update for everyone, I want to share where folks are joining us from and um, visiting this uh, sacred and special place of Papahanaumokuakea. Uh, we are uh, about a thousand miles uh, west of the main Hawaiian islands, the high islands. We are uh, over 150 miles from Kuaihalani, Midway Atoll, and we're really pleased to bring you all here. So right now there are viewers from 
Austria, Switzerland, Denmark, Spain, Israel, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, the Philippines, Russia. Uh, hi to our viewers in Singapore and Canada, in France, in New Zealand, in Australia, in Germany, the United Kingdom, and of course, uh, central players in this story, um, viewers both in Japan and the United States. Um, this is a shared history. It's a history of our oceans and a place that connects us all. And we're really pleased to be able to bring you here and um, have this experience together and learn more and connect. Yeah, I think we can see here where the uh, the, the flight deck shorn off, um, that uh, square part to the top. Um, yeah, it must have, um, I mean, it did sink stern first, so it may have fallen off at that point if it was damaged. There was a uh, significant piece of debris about uh, 20, yeah. 30 meters uh, further astern here. Yeah, it could be that too. If we could drop down a little bit, I don't think that number five was on the back of Yorktown. I think it was just the letters Yorktown, but we could just take another quick look. Sure. We're still swinging in just a bit here. Okay, yeah, do wait till we're not swinging towards the um, ship for sure. I don't mind, but <laughs> okay. well, I'll just <laughs> let you know we should get a couple meters closer in theory. Okay. <laughs> Trying to get just about 10 meters away. It seems to be a good uh, distance to get some imagery in. Yeah, the, the, it seems like the whole ship is buried in the mud quite a bit. Uh, above the waterline. What an incredible view! That's a great shot of the stern. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I, I can I can tease myself to say, oh yeah, I see letters, but I, I'm not sure I do. Well, I think we see the outlines of something. Yeah. Oh, I do see it. Where? It's like kind of in the middle. Um, do you want to zoom? But it, like, I, I can make out letters, but I, I don't, I can only kind of convince myself that it says Yorktown. Probably because I know it says it. Uh, we're still inching closer there. And so incredible to see this massive encrusting sponge here. Just a reminder that uh, the shipwreck is living on in a new life, in a new story um, here on the seabed, continuing the story of our oceans. and. Um, becoming a settling place or a habitat for creatures who um, will make their homes here. I'm gonna have to take a, a screenshot of that back and print it out and like trace it or something and figure it out. I'm I'm pretty sure it's that's where it is. I just it's overgrown and uh, quite a bit. It really has buried a lot of the starboard side yeah. there. We wouldn't have seen anything along that hull. No, not much at all. Yeah, nothing really. Can you circle where you're looking at, Mike? Yeah, sorry. Oh, it's moving too much. There. Hmm. But I might be making it up. Yeah, we're not seeing the rudders or the screws. Oh, yeah, that, it those sits are in the mud. Those deeply. are very, very deeply buried. Yeah. No, we we not seeing, but letters are there. Yeah, letters are there. It's just hard to read. Yeah, still, once uh, you see it, you can see it. I can. Yeah. Can we zoom? The, the R there, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Jana. Zoom in there on the... Oh, that's a good shot. Mm -hmm. Hold that for a second for us. Oh, it's hard to make out. Just saw the end right yeah. there. Right York. in there, yeah. yeah. Got it. Oof. Right. There's some, I can see the outlines of yeah, some Yeah, I see letters. the R. I think the printout later on would be an easier yeah. way to do it. Yeah, this is moving too much. Thanks, guys. Wow, that's so special to be able to see the name. Um, 
So yeah, when you guys are ready, we can um, circle back to the left and start a mud, you know, a mud line, but um, if kind of looking a little bit forward rather than straight on to the wreck so that we can see if there's like debris or anything in the way. Um, and just kind of, we'll do the same thing. We can do 30 meter moves back towards the bow. All right. Well, they didn't jettison those guns. Those nope. 20 millimeters are still there. Of course, they weren't on the port side, so they wouldn't have bothered with those. Oh, yeah, true. This is going to uh, pop up real quick here, Mike. Yep, while when you're ready. Back and so are we returning down the same side we just went down, or um, back on the side we first approached? Port side. Port side. I can see some of the bits on the stern deck. The fair leads for the mooring lines and the bits further in on the stern deck to take those mooring lines. Continuing to swing in and <coughs> come up. Uh, let's try 10 meters, two, seven, uh, two, Eight five. Yes, please. And uh, Mike, we did another round of introductions when you were uh, when you stepped out of the room. Do you mind just uh, quickly introducing yourself for our new viewers? Oh yeah, hi. I'm uh, Mike Brennan, a maritime archaeologist with Search. And I'm the uh, co-lead scientist for this uh, expedition to the Papahana Makaika, um National Marine Monument. Is the flight deck missing from this aft section? Um, I'm looking down into that. Yeah, I think. Oh, yeah. Looks like more of it might be missing than we thought. Look that way. The overhang's missing in the top of this aft section, which yeah. should have been all flight deck. Interesting. Was that in any of the records of the battle damage, or do you anticipate that was from the sinking event? Well, there wasn't. There wasn't a particular strike here. Um, I don't believe so. It must be sinking damage. I think so. And Taylor Ann had some images up of the, the vessel peeling over to port during the rescue efforts, and it didn't look like this section was missing on the aft flight deck. Yeah, there's also no, I mean, all the torpedoes were either midships or forward, and the bomb, the one bomb hit was um, just past the stack, so there's nothing back here that would have uh, would have done it. Yeah, maybe that's, uh, it went straight down and impact there and then tipped over maybe landed where it, how it's sitting now Was the flight deck uh, kind of like a lot of structure there? Is that timbers that we see in the yeah. top left corner? Yeah, those are some of the supports for it. How big were the timbers? I think they were steel. Steel timbers with a uh, wooden overlay? Yeah. Hmm. And this is something we were talking about earlier. Um, Hans, you mentioned like the lack of uh, boring shipworms in the wood. So just to clarify that, this 
Um, the ship was made of steel, wood, um, any other materials? Well, the bulk of it, of course, is, is steel. And, uh, but uh, steel would be pretty tough to walk on in the hot sun. So um, they would, for many reasons, they would cover the flight deck with wood. It's still common to use uh, timber on the deck. Yeah. A uh, Japanese vessel I work on has uh, four by six timbers on the entire back deck. Well, thanks for that clarification. And as things uh, sink, you're talking about how they might be biologically degraded by like worms that bore into that wood. Um, I'm sure there's also corrosion involved. Yeah, uh, oh yeah. Can you talk about like what processes start to break down the ship? over time? Uh, yeah, I mean, corrosion's a big one when it comes to um, steel ships. Um, you know, we've seen in Titanic that it, ten on it's starting to really um, deteriorate and uh, and some of the, the bulkheads are collapsing and decks are collapsing. Um, USS Saratoga, which is at Bikini Atoll, um, it's, it, its deck is collapsing a lot more than this one because um, we think we hypothesize that micro fractures from the nuclear blast um, allows more seawater to come in, and so the whole oh. structure is co corroding Thanks. from the inside, kind Thanks, of. Mia. This one doesn't have that, so it's going to corrode slower. Um, but you know, all steel vessels will corrode uh, quite extensively in the marine environment. Uh, the wood on wooden uh, on wooden vessels, if it's uh, if it's not buried uh, in in sediment, they will be consumed by wood boring mollusks um and and the same will be true uh, here so um yeah th it'll definitely be be consumed by a lot but it, i mean it'll take hundreds if not hundreds of years if not longer and, and in the interim it'll be the home for um sponges corals all these things that we're seeing anemones that are that are growing on and using the the structure of the wreck to get themselves up into the current to to feed on the the detritus coming down. Right. I believe members of our science team were pointing out there was a lot of anemones in a patch just now. Um, does the depth have anything to do with how well it stays preserved because of the cold temperature or does the pressure affect it? Um, the temperature can. Um, the pressure, probably not as much. Um, but like... Uh, Wrecks that are in in warmer tropical waters and shallow water will will deteriorate faster than than down here in the cold. Um, what are we at for a temperature here? Uh, probably like two degrees or something. Um, oh yeah, we don't have. Oh, I guess we do have a CT. I just don't know where it is. Um, but yeah, it's uh, they they don't corrode as fast when they're not in sunlight with uh, and in warm okay. waters. And then you mentioned before burial and sediment. So would they be kind of preserved if they're buried in sediment, or would more yeah, microbes so, get to it? W well, microbes will get to it, but they don't. They won't consume wood as nearly as fast as the the shipworms do. Mm -hmm. um, actually, an anoxic environment will preserve wood um, kind of indefinitely. Got it. And for our viewers, if you're um, unfamiliar, the term anoxic means without oxygen. So a lot of times when we're talking about these deep ocean sediments. Um, they don't have that much oxygen in the mud or um, silt or soil. But the, the deck timbers would have been treated somehow, or were they just raw? Pro proper? Probably, but I'm not sure with what. Back in that t at that time. Hmm. I wouldn't expect them to just be raw.
measurement from right there to right there. put us back on the same line that we came down on. Yeah, we'll, we'll take, we'll try another 10. That'll give us a little more space. We were pretty close uh, when we dropped down there. Yes, please. There's a hole. theory we should be just on the other side of that line and then follow it back in theory <laughs> there's a whole section of that deck planking that's lifted off and it's yeah. over the open stern so it could have taken more of the force of the water on the way down or lifted those planks or something. But it looks like it's pretty caved in there on the... Is that metal superstructure that we're seeing there that's... Yeah. Bent? Yep. And beneath that you can see the pillars that supported the overhang of the, the flight deck aft. But that whole section below that superstructure was open. Of course, you had to handle the lines at the stern and uh, needed access. So was the whole purpose built for the carrier? Or was uh, like the flight deck an add-on to an existing design? I think I think these were, um, were, were cruisers, right? Initially. Well, I, don't, I don't know that. I would have guessed purpose built, but that's a good question for our shoreside team. Town class were purpose built aircraft carriers. They were not conversion. Right. And, you know, some, some of the damage we're seeing here on the stern quarter may be related to a near miss that oh, had yeah, shrapnel true. damage. Yeah. You know, may, may have loosened not only planking, but you know, also some kind of, some of the steel structure and combined with the pressure of water on its descent to the seafloor may be partly of what we're seeing here. Do we think it came down horizontally or vertically? Well, it um, so it sank by the stern. Um, but we have photos of that. Uh -huh. My, th uh, I suspect that like other aircraft carriers that have sunk, the um, the flight deck acts as kind of like a parachute and entrains water underneath it, uh, coming in through the open hangar deck windows. So uh -huh. um, I think it'll kind of like flow back and forth in the water and kind of settle, uh, which is why even this, this sank mostly upside down, but it righted itself, uh, because I think the flight deck um, kind of will, will catch the water in that way. So it kind of floated down like a leaf? Yeah, exactly. Very, very heavy leaf. Mm. And, you know, while we're here, one more quick thought on that near miss, which is an event you know, as, as a, an event where a piece of armament deployed by the enemy didn't directly in, didn't directly um, strike Yorktown in this case. Um, but there is a note from the after action report that this near miss astern exploded at the ocean surface. So there was probably considerable 
concussion and, and shrapnel um, from that blast that may be solely related to some of the damage we're seeing. Okay, Navigator, what is uh, 215 minus 180? That would be our... I was just going to ask. <laughs> I literally typed that in. All right, um, do you want to step three zero meters? Yes, please. All righty. Bridge, Nav, can we step three zero meters uh, bearing three five? Mm, look at that. You've Thank magically, you, Bridge. Magically put the boat exactly on the line we came down on. It's almost like we planned it. I don't know <laughs> what all this business was. But. We could do uh, 35 meter steps just to be in sync with the with the degree. I'm joking. <laughs> 35 at 35. Oh wow! That explains some things. <laughs> I am. Okay, I think what Mike's asking us to do is uh, break all the rules and go single digit altitude with Atlanta. I don't know that we need to go single digit. As long as we can see the bottom, we can meet maybe be nine and a half meters up. Roger. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's double digits. I never <laughs> thought about that. It's the... Uh, moving target right here so it's hey mike and han so for people who are just tuning in can you give us a quick rundown of what we're looking at on the screen right now and also what we're trying to maneuver to look at as we lower the atalanta yeah so we're on the wreck of uss yorktown uh an aircraft carrier that was sunk in 1942 as part of the battle of midway um we're now at the stern. We came down on the uh, on the stack earlier, and we came around the bow and then up the uh, port side. Uh, we were looking at the flight deck and the, the very edge of that and some of the, the battle damage from it. And now we're going to be moving back along the same route and looking at the mud line to see if we can see damage from the torpedoes uh, that led to it sinking, contributed to it sinking. Okay, thank you. And if we do find evidence of that, would that be something, um, a novel thing that we would see, so sort of an exciting um, sight, or is it something that's been observed, it's just never been seen uh, in person? Um, I can't remember if, if they saw it in 98. Um, it, it's, it's just further um, documentation and characterization of, of the site. Um, we're trying to, you know, take a look at battle damage and effects from, you know, the sinking. Uh, but we're also trying to look at um, the site formation, so how it impacted the seabed, um, what organisms are growing on it now. It's, uh, it's 81 years after it sank and 25 years after Dr. Ballard found it in 98. So it's kind of like a follow-up um, mission to to see what's changed on the site and, and kind of get additional uh, footage uh, from from the last time it was looked at. Um, and I, I'm not entirely sure if if the damage along the hull was, was found back then or not. Okay. So just being here, obviously, 25 years, or as you said, 81 years after it sank and 25 years after the last survey is an honor and just very exciting. 
but is there sort of a highlight from, we're, we're a few hours into the dive, is there something you'd like to highlight um, that we found so far, or just um, sort of discovering, more discovery along the, all along the perimeter? Yeah, mostly that. I'd like to see um, if we can find some of the torpedo damage. Um, I'd also like, we're going to come back along the flight deck later, uh, and I, I'm curious to see how the, uh, the bomb damage, um, which is uh, just past the, the stack, looks like. Um, and just the general condition of the flight deck. So there's still some points, some things that we we need to take a look at. Is that the uh, is that the waterline we're looking at there, Mike? Right at the mud line. Yeah, I mean it, it's pretty close. It's, I think it's pretty close to the waterline uh, at this point. The bow is obviously much deeper in. So how, how much is below that kind of painted line there where the white ends in the dark? Is that is it shown on our drawing here, is it? Hmm. Ship has completed its 30 meter move. Atlanta's still thinking about it. According to the general information page, USS Yorktown CV5 had a draft of 26 feet. 26 feet. The bottom of the keel. When you say draft, do you mean the line? Water line at the bottom of the keel. So that doesn't mean the bottom of the keel is right there aft, but the main bottom of the keel, center line of the ship, to the water line, 26 feet. Where the vessel draws 26 feet of water, that's another way to put it. As we're waiting for Atalanta to swing around, um, you guys may have already talked about this, but how is this look in comparison to some of the other World War II wrecks? Because I think one or both of you have been on Lexington, right? Um, I can't hear you, Mike. Yep. We haven't been on Lexington. That was found by uh, the Petrel and the Vulcan Inc. team in tw uh, 2018, I think, maybe 2019. Um, so, but um, we, we've worked on a couple of other ones. What was the exact question? I was just asking how similar they look. Oh, um, so this is actually, I've done a lot of work on um, on Operation Crossroads ships. So ones at um, Bikini Atoll that were sunk by the nuclear test in 1946. And uh, some of the vessels that are, were sunk uh, that were at Bikini but scuttled elsewhere, like USS Independence off San Francisco and, and USS Nevada off of uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, and none of those were sunk in battle. They were sunk intentionally. So this is uh, one of the first World War II wrecks that I've worked on that was actually sunk uh, in battle, which is which is very unique. So looking at battle damage and the the actions of the sailors trying to save the vessel is a is a very new thing to be documenting for me. Um, typically, it's like oh yeah, you know they sunk it sunk it with a nuke or they sunk it with gunfire and here it is. So this is this is much more of a, you know, the heroics of the crew and and um, and the story of of its act of its sinking as you know with the people on board, um, fighting fires and that sort of thing. It's it's a it's a much more engaging story, um, you know, for the loss of the ship. Yeah, mm -hmm. as I mentioned before, I'm just amazed that they tried to mitigate the list by cutting away 400 pound anti-aircraft guns, the 20 millimeter guns, but 
I also didn't know that they managed to jettison a five inch gun, which of course weighed a lot more, but that kind of thing when you're jettisoning the guns is, um, you know, one of the, the last kinds of moves you'd, you'd want to be trying. You try anything at that point. And if anyone wants to go into a deeper dive and um, read through more of that history, on our website, nautiluslive.org, there is a blog post, The Battle of Midway, a pivotal World War II engagement within Papa Hanao Mo Kuakea. Um, so feel free to visit that resource. It has photos and a detailed uh, timeline of what happened and uh, overview of the recent history and archaeological efforts as well. And within our gallery page, there's also um, a whole section on maritime history um, with other uh, previous um, Nautilus Live um, expeditions that involved uh, exploring marine archaeology. Are those the degaussing cables, Mike? Oh, maybe. Um, that was actually something I didn't even know about. Uh, but that's a good guess. Did you say degassing? Degaussing. Degaussing de cables. They're used to reduce the electrical signature of the ship, the magnetic signature of the ship. Mm. Sometimes they had cables on the ships they could charge, and uh, in other places, actually in the Hawaiian Islands, there were degaussing stations where they had large cables run offshore, and ships mm. would come and moor over them. And they would oh, charge wow. the cables and use that huh. to reduce the magnetic signature before setting off for the the battle in the South Pacific. Yeah, I didn't I didn't know about that. That's cool. And the purpose of that, if I'm degaussing. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that. Were there other measures that uh, enhanced their stealth besides degaussing? Camouflage paint. Camouflage, Camouflage paint. schemes, painting schemes. That was, you know, widely used in World War One as well, where they would come up with different paint schemes to try to break up the silhouette of the vessel on the horizon. Are, um, are you guys ready for another move of 35 at 35? <laughs> yeah, you should do that. <laughs> Dan suggested. That's awesome. Bridge, bridge nav. Can we move uh, 35, <laughs> uh, sorry, three, five meters at 35 uh, degree bearing? Requested by the 35 year old. Thank you, bridge. I hope they're laughing at that too. <laughs> that you changed your typical. <laughs> <laughs> he just left oh really hard. Jeez, that just scared me. Hey, what what is that thing on the hole there? Huh? You guys see it underneath that uh, underneath that opening beneath the cable? There's something that looks like something attached to the hole. Almost like a grapple hook or a tripod or something. Yeah. Starfish? I'm not sure what that is. I f forgot the names of those. You see those at the sterns of destroyers yeah. as well? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the sterns of destroyers, like for stabilization, that's not going to help at all. It had lines tied to the uh, hangar uh, area. Uh, Alexis is looking at the plans, and it may be an existing mount. Yeah, I remember ladder. seeing it in a, in a photo uh, in one of the books. 
I remember seeing that it had those things. They're, they're really small. I don't know what purpose they served. Hmm. Like, Hans is right, destroyers have them, but they, like, take up, like, they're a lot bigger. of, most of the stern. This is, like, not going to do anything. No. You said those grappling hooks were used on destroyers a lot? Well, they're not grappling hooks. It's like a... a tripod step in a way or something i'm not really sure the purpose of it okay um it, it, i thought that on destroyers i thought that they were stabilizers of some sort but maybe, perhaps not so you think that this is a part of the ship or something that was latched onto this it, ship? no it, it's part of the it's ship part of yeah the ship. okay yeah um that that <laughs> i do know because i remember seeing um photos of it in, in okay one of the books. in one of the books yeah Uh, that structure that we were looking at, um, a friend of ours listening named Jeff Barda um, identified that as a paravane guide. Carabine tie? Paravane guide. Paravane. Okay. Paravane for streaming a pair. Yeah, for sailing up paravanes in the water. Oh, okay. Cool. Thank you. Can you elucidate that a bit more for people like us? <laughs> Paravane is kind of a wing on a wire, and so when you wanted to sweep a wire outboard from a moving ship, you, oh. you put a paravane on it and oh, send it out. Okay. Okay. Yeah. A paravane is a mm. device towed behind a boat at a depth regulated by its vanes. So the cable which it is attached to can cut the moorings of submerged mines. Ah, smart. Sometimes oh, that's why destroyers would have them. Sometimes you see paravanes on the decks, you know, latched down to the decks of ships. Mm -hmm. I think I've even seen pictures of paravanes on board the, the decks of the Japanese aircraft carriers. Oh. Kaga mm. and Akagi. Yeah. So it's, it's a common thing for ships to have if there are minefields around. Sure, yeah. Huh. Cool. Learn something. That, that hull's pretty clean. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking that. It's like very, there's no damage, there's no growth. It's just, yep, hull. And the, and the seabed seems to just not have any debris on it, at least here either. We'll right. get there, we'll see some. Do you guys know what those sand dollar sand dollar looking um, circles are? I think they're like they look like portholes of some sort. Thoughts? Yeah, look like ports. Those would in fact be portholes. Could you give um, like a reference? Because normally we usually have uh, the lasers to show us like 10 cent centimeters apart. Uh, can you give us an idea of like how large that circle might be or how large this opening into the ship might be? Uh, 
I don't know. Maybe what the, uh, like a foot in diameter. Yeah, a foot or more. I don't know what the exact measurement would yeah. be. Science, are you ready for another 3-5? Yep, sounds good. Bridge nav, can we step another 3-5 meters going, uh, heading, uh, sorry, a bearing of 35 degrees? Thank you, bridge. Here's a little known fact, the headquarters building on Maui for the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary is in a building that was used for, we think it was used for the degaussing station during the war. And it had the large generators ashore and uh, the cable connections that run down to the water. The cables in the ocean are gone. Those are copper. I don't know what happened oh. to those, but those went away pretty quickly wow. with, with the price of copper. But we think we've looked at the mooring for the ships that came inshore to use the, the degaussing station. It's a large submerged mooring for Navy ships. Thanks for sharing that. Hawaiian Islands would have been quite a different site during these years with the number of ships and squadrons in the air, the amount of land devoted to military practice, jungle warfare training, artillery practice. Mm. Very busy, very loud. Wow. And then, then whole divisions of the Marines, you know, living ashore in various places. Mm. Do you know how many people would have been on Midway? approximately? Uh, the number escapes me. During during the battle, during the defense, you know, they, they, they sent more Marines up there. There was a construction battalion there already, of course. And then the, 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 the air wing, the, the squadrons and planes that flew in. Right. I imagine for what it had been, it was a pretty crowded place in preparation, in fast preparation right. for the battle. So Hans, I think I remember you saying that you have been to Midway Atoll. Yes. And it's uh, mostly avian residents there now, correct? Yes, <laughs> yes. Thankfully, it's home for the, the, the Goonie birds again, the albatross and other seabirds. And it really is their place. And your nose will tell you that when you get off the plane or the, the ship and get onto that atoll. And for a little more geological history, um, the uh, the Mid Midway Island is part of the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, also known as the Aina Kua, the Sacred Elder Islands of Native Hawaiians. And they were formed roughly 28 million years ago over um, a volcano over the Hawaiian hotspot. And Midway Atoll has slowly subsided and weathered into a ring-shaped atoll. So you can learn about these geological formations online and these processes. Um, 
And Midway Atoll is located approximately one third of the way between Honolulu and Tokyo, or halfway between North America and Asia. And like um, Else and Hans were just uh, discussing right now, it is really home to amazing ocean wildlife, including millions of seabirds that uh, use this this uh, small piece of land, I, I believe, on migration routes, but you can double check that. Uh, and in 1938, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers did dredge the lagoon to deepen the port. Like Hans was saying, there's a lot of development at that time. Um, it was a really important naval base, really only second in priority compared to Pearl Harbor. Here's a question that, Hans, maybe you know the answer to. Do you know why it was named Pearl Harbor? Is it as simple as people die for pearls in it? I think there were pearls there. Yeah. 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 Hmm. It's of a really... Course it, of course, it has a Hawaiian name. Bulalua. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course it does. And, uh, but, you know, people have often wondered why there are locks in Pearl Harbor. West lock, east lock, hmm. middle lock. Because one of the engineers uh, that first surveyed the harbor in the, the early 1800s was Scottish. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. I think it's a really cool um, geographical feature, like the physics, uh, the geology and the physics of it forming is in between the two valleys is like, you know, have all those, the rivers or the streams coming together to form that. It's a very, I mean, it's a perfect harbor. Um, so it's very cool. Uh, I got a photo of it from the air when we took off uh, from Honolulu one time, uh, which is pretty cool. And I can confirm that the name Pearl Harbor does indeed come because there were an abundance of oyster pearls there once before. It has a nice ring to it, but it's not a very creative name, to be honest. <laughs> And what was the Hawaiian name? Oh, I think it was Pu'uloa. Pu'uloa? Pu'uloa. Pu'uloa. But we'd have to check with, uh, you know, the, the experts. Yeah. Yes. It's a contested area. It's not an easy history. You know, not there at were all, a number yeah. of, of fish ponds there. Oh, really? It, it huh. was used. It was, you know, a, a lovely place. But uh, the United States gained the rights to it along with a treaty for the kingdom gaining a treaty for shipping sugar to the mainland territory. Oh, yeah. So um, science, sorry to interrupt. Are you ready for me to do another three, five meters? Yep. I can also confirm um, Pu'ulo is the correct Hawaiian name for Pearl Harbor. Um, also can be referred to as Vai Momi, which also means water of pearl. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, but it was like very heavily militarized, uh, industrialized, and I mean, especially after 1941, the amount of oil and other stuff that went through there probably killed all, any of the wildlife that had been left at least for, the, for a time. Well, and there's still, there's still burps of oil coming off of Arizona into the harbor. Yeah. My mother worked there. Yeah, yeah, I think in, you mentioned in, that. In December 1941. Oh, then, oh. Oh, you did mention that, yeah, 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 a, yeah. But of course it was Sunday, so, you know, she was not there, they yeah. were at their house in Pearl City up above the harbor. Yeah. And you just mentioned that something about oil, and I think, Hans, you have mentioned before that continual oil leaks from shipwrecks is a hazard. Is that true? It's definitely a consideration. There's, a, there's interest in the issue of potentially polluting wrecks, PPWs. Oh, OK. And uh, when, particularly when they're in sensitive environments. There right. have been a couple cases in the Pacific 
where tankers in lagoons in mm -hmm. atolls have been mitigated by pumping that fuel oil out. Wow. One was the Mississinawa and Ulithi Atoll. And actually there was a tanker that sank in Pongo Pongo Harbor in American Samoa, territory mm -hmm. of American Samoa. It was a little bit after the war, there was a fire and they pushed the tanker off because they couldn't extinguish the flames. It was at the fuel mm -hmm. dock and that had aviation gas in it. So more recently, as a training exercise, the uh, Mobile Diving Salvage Unit 1, Mudsu 1, here mm -hmm. went down to Pearl Harbor and hot tapped those those bunkers and removed wow. a lot of that aviation gas. Wow, I imagine that's a pretty complicated and intensive operation, especially if you get a little deeper. So is that only really available for shallow uh, wrecks, this mitigation it's response? It's mostly been done for shallow wrecks by uh, teams of commercial divers. Wow. It is theoretically possible by ROVs, so they've done it on oh. more more modern vessels. There's one called I forget some. It was a it was a ship off of Spain that sank in like 2,000 feet of water, something like that. And they they did manage to to pump most of the oil out with just ROVs that that use the hot tapping uh, devices um, and connected the hoses. So, you know, with, with the development of a lot of these industrial ROVs for the oil industry, um, it is possible, but it's not been done on a historic vessel yet. Um, we also need to go find a lot of these historic vessels that have the potential to pollute, and a lot of them are in deep water, and we haven't found them. Mm. Right. Wow, thanks. I had no idea ROVs could be used in that way. That's pretty amazing yeah. technology. However, in an amazing feat of daring do on the ship Oceanus Explorer, Dr. Michael Brennan, working with the NOAA team, was able to locate the World War II loss of the Bloody Marsh, document its overturned hull, and discern that leaking oil was indeed coming from that vessel, leading to the possibility that a future mission might just do that. Thou art too, uh, too, uh, too <laughs> demure. It was a really... It was an epic feat that you and the, and the team of the Oceanus Explorer pulled off. Yeah, so we, we um, in 2021, we uh, we mapped with an area off of South Carolina with uh, Oceanus Explorer and uh, based on some satellite data that we had of, of oil slicks on the surface and, uh, and found a deep water, like 500 meter deep water uh, wreck of an oil tanker sunk in World War II called the Bloody Marsh. Um, which is a, a candidate for oil removal if somebody feels the need. Um, it is actively leaking, so and it's upside down, so most of the oil is trapped in the hull. The Okeanos was the first ship I sailed on. Oh, cool. Who said that? Oh, hi, Mia. Yep. Yeah. Did you guys talk about the uh, damage done was it the Battle of Coral Sea that the Yorktown was damaged in and then went to Pearl? Yeah, I think that was mostly um, bombs that hit the flight deck. Uh, so, and those were repaired. Uh, and, and then, you know, they punched through. So it was whatever they damaged on the inside. Um, I don't think uh, any of the hull was breached. So you don't see any remnants of that here? Uh, we have n no. I mean, I think that. Well, we're going to do the flight deck next, but I think that the damage we see will be from Midway. Um, I don't know how extensive those repairs were, but they were good enough that, you know, aircraft were launching and landing on it. Yeah, viewers should realize as, as we're chatting, we're still moving up the mud line on the port side and looking for torpedo damage in the hull. Haven't seen any, but we are, we are paying attention. Yeah, and it's also just, um, you know, it's good to have 100% documentation of the, the, the hull just, for, you know, to, re to go back and review. Uh, we're not going to be doing this. We're getting, we're getting closer. Can you guys pan a little to the right? To the right or to Please? the left? Uh, aft. Aft. Okay. Which is right on our screen. Yeah. Well, what are you looking for? Uh, well, we're going to position ourselves. To position ourselves, because Alexis has the plans, and we know which frame. If he figures out what frame we're at, we can tell you approximately how much further. Okay. 
and then we'll dab it for the Comanche. Yeah, we'll have to dab it. Because right. so we'll right. one hit was at about frame 80, and the other was at about, what, 95? It's between 140 and 150. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's so, that right away. So, Alexis, where are we at? About frame 140? Well, we're looking at a single opening with where the uh, yeah we're at frame 135 at the moment. Okay. So we're at frame 135, um, and we need to get to about frame 90. I think you're. Yeah, I think they struck at 90 and 75, right? 90 and 72, really good. Okay. Are you uh, ready? Um, no, another another said 80. It's a big yeah, hole. I, I think I'd like us to, to pan a little bit more left so we can continue to look for obstacles and debris. And then when we get there, we can we can pan over to look for the sure. damage. Do you want me to move another 35 meters or do you want to wait? Wait for what? Uh, for panning right now. No, no. No, we can move. All right, Roger. And just to answer a question from the chat, we are extremely deep right now, over 5,000 meters deep or about three miles. We are looking, on the, looking at the USS Yorktown um, and surveying for what kind of damage uh, caused by torpedoes and the state of this uh, shipwreck um, as we continue to explore up the port side of the Yorktown. And we just want to acknowledge that um, this is in a very sacred place for Native Hawaiians, the Papahanaumo Kuakea Marine National Monument. And this expedition is really a testament to the amazing uh, collaboration between many uh, international organizations. Uh, this expedition was funded by the NOAA Ocean Ex uh, Office for Ocean Exploration. Um, the, and it was in collaboration with the U.S. Naval History and Heritage Command, uh, International Midway Memorial Foundation, of course, Papahanaumo Kuakea Marine National Monument, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, the State of Hawaii, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, University of Maryland, University of Rhode Island, University of Hawaii, um, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and Defense and um, many colleagues, uh, Japanese archaeological colleagues. Um, so again, this is really uh, an amazing team we have here of uh, experts looking at this shipwreck. Alexis reports you are now at frame 120. Roger that, thank you.
And Mia, correct me if I'm wrong, but just to clarify for viewers as well, um, this is kind of a, a slower dive uh, just because our Atalanta is connected to the ship by so much cable, again, 5,000 meters, so it takes a while for us to um, move. As the ship moves, Atalanta has to move with all that cable as well. Is that correct, Mia? Yeah, that is correct. Dan would be able to speak to that better, and Jake too. Um, but we have to, uh, you know, think of it as a pendulum. As the ship moves, it takes a while uh, for Atalanta at the end of the very long cable to have that, um, to move move the direction that we wanted to. Was it, what's the, how many feet per minute or meters per m Alexis reports you're at frame 110 now. Roger that, thank you. And just answering a question, so um, on a time scale, how long did it take for uh, Yorktown to sink? We know that it was hit by, you know, multiple rounds of damage um, through multiple da uh, battles, but how long was this battle um, and how long did it take for Yorktown to really fully succumb? Um, Yorktown was during the, uh, the main battle on June 4th, uh, my attacks from the Japanese carrier Hear You. Um, she was hit the first attack by bombs, the second one by uh, two torpedoes. After the second attack, she was abandoned on June 4th, left to drift through the night, and was still afloat on the 5th. And uh, the crew reboarded her and began uh, salvage operations. And uh, the destroyer Hammond came alongside to provide power uh, for, the, for the damage control party. And the ship was taking a tow, and they were heading back to Pearl when the Japanese I-boat um, sighted her and fired spread torpedoes on the, uh, this was on June 6th at this point, and one hit the, um, the Hammond and destroyed her. Uh, two hit the Yorktown and one missed. Um, Yorktown, the hand sank instantly. Um, the Yorktown was abandoned again and again and left to drift through the night um, of uh, June 6th. And she uh, finally foundered uh, on the morning of June 7th, about 5 o'clock in the morning. I think we might be at the torpedo damage now. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. <laughs> so what's fascinating about this torpedo damage is it's not what sank <laughs> the Yorktown. Um, they were able to keep this, keep it afloat, 
right, right it a little bit, pump out some of the water, and then it was torpedoes on the other side from a different attack that actually sank it. Oh, wow. If we could get a little bit closer, if you don't, if you're able to. Okay. Yeah, that'll help. Thanks. I'm not sure what that block is sticking out of that hole. Is it hull plate? It could be. What was that, Hans? I'm wondering if it's measures for repair. Hull plate. That looks significant. Yeah, it's quite large. What, what's our ROV altitude right now? Uh, 12 meters. Wow. These aircraft carriers did not have torpedo blisters, did they? they uh, I don't believe so. Yeah. I mean, to control the flooding from that. Is... I'm not sure anything did at this point in the war, actually. Yeah. Huh. I think they put them on. At this oh, no. point, no, the, these carriers did not have any torpedo blisters. Yeah. And they had been installed on the modernized battleship, but yeah. uh, the carriers did not have uh, side protection. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. That's just hull plating there. That's twisted hull plating. Yeah. It looked like a like insulation or a sponge or something, the color of it. Yeah. Oh yeah, that is a big hole there. Yeah, it's amazing to think this did not sink I know. the ship. <laughs> this wasn't what did it. Can you circle where the damage is? Make a your, big uh, make a big circle, Mike. With your, that yeah. <laughs> so did the, the torpedo hit from this side? Yeah, so the torpedoes hit, um, I think it was two, one hit here and one hit a little bit further forward. Um, on, this is on the port side. And then two struck just under the, the, the stack uh, on the starboard side, then like a day or two later. It looks like the metal kind of peeled back. Yeah. Yeah. Peeled open like a can. Yeah. See, that that's common for torpedo because the torpedo will punch through and then detonate inside, so it'll often be uh, pulled back, the, the metal's back pushed back. outward, yeah. Wow. My guess is the compartment's flooded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was the hit on the bottom of the hull, or did it hit another part of the ship? Uh, it hit uh, the side of the hull below the water line.
So on this floor of the aircraft carrier, what would it be, um, where would the water have been rushing into? Uh, these are some of the lower compartments. So you, you have like engine room and uh, fuel tanks and that sort of stuff on in these lower uh, areas. Gotcha. Is that where kind of um, they would aim for, fuel tanks, the engine rooms, places that could kind of stop um, the ship, halt it in? They weren't necessarily aiming for one particular spot. Um, a lot of times, especially earlier on, um, they were just lucky. They were just hoping to get a hit. A lot of times torpedoes missed or were evaded. Um, or, and, and actually, U.S. torpedoes often didn't go off. Uh, they had they had a problem with the uh, the detonation, um, and they, they fixed them uh, like a year after this happened. But a lot of the torpedoes that the U.S. dropped from the planes that took off from Midway, when they struck, um, they didn't hit, or they didn't detonate uh, against anything. They just were duds. Wow. So this is Shore Party. As we're at this hit, um, one of the iconic images from the battle was the catwalk having been blown up by the geyser of water from this torpedo head. If the ROV is, if you can Atlanta up, and we can climb up towards the deck. It's interesting to see if that still remains in place from that iconic image of, uh, of Yorktown after the hit. Uh, is that something you guys think we can do? While you're doing this as well, Russ Manning has added that the Japanese Type 91 Mod 3 aerial torpedo carried a 235 kg, 518 pound high explosive warhead. And again, those detonations create that high pressure bubble that you see just basically pushes that steel plate right on. Mike, remember looking at the, the torpedo damage from the Japanese torpedoes that struck and uh, sank? Coast Trader? Yeah. At this stage in the war, the Japanese did field one of the best torpedoes in the world, and we're looking at the evidence of that right now. It's this damage from this hit and then the other, the second hit, that did the lift that threatened to capsize in Pink Yorktown, and it was, as we've seen earlier in this stock, the effort of the crew to lighten the load, to cut away gun tub bulkheads, to get rid of heavy guns, to throw them over the side, to counter flood, to try to get Yorktown back up on an even keel. And they effectively did that. It was not until the I-168 struck your captain with its torpedoes and sank your Hammond at the same time that your town was finally doomed. And then, still, it took a while to die. This is one tough area. I think this damage extends down, you know, beneath the mud line. Oh, for sure, maybe yeah. Maybe beneath where we can yeah. even see. Absolutely. And maybe has even filled in in the yeah. bottom. It's pretty extensive, and it just goes down, down, down. Wow. And just for some context, this is a pretty amazing moment right now, I believe, because uh, Yorktown, the location was discovered in 1998 uh, by a joint U.S. Navy and National Geographic Society expedition led by Dr. Robert Ballard, but at that time, um, direct physical evidence um, of the damage was uh, not able to be found, and a, a more comprehensive archaeological survey of the wreck was not conducted, so this is really offering some more details. Is that a fire hose? Is that a hose? The, the black Yeah. Thing. It could be, yeah.
videos on comms. Yeah, I can only move in whole f-stops. And to all our viewers, thank you for joining on the 12 to 4 watch. We are doing a watch change, uh, so you might hear some shuffling around. Uh, please continue to keep exploring with us, and uh, we hope that we can continue honoring this really sacred place and time in history. You still back there, Mike? So for those of you that are tuning in uh, elsewhere around the world, as we assess this, the entire team is taking the same basic approach as archaeologists and historians that crime scene investigators do. This is an opportunity for a slow, consistent, systematic assessment of every bit of evidence. We know from historical accounts, from eyewitnesses, from photographs taken of the battle, that you know an aerial torpedo did strike here in and around frame 92. Frames, by the way, are the, the ribs of a ship, and uh, in naval parlance and uh, in ship naval construction, each one has a number. Exactly for the t same reason we're talking about it in this way. In a damage report, you can say I've got a hit at frame 92. It's not just for reporting, but it also helps guide damage control for getting to the problem area and fixing it. So we know that there's a second torpedo hit also in the account that said it struck somewhere in or around frame 82, uh, all the way back to potentially frame 70. And we'll get a better sense of that as we move along. But in this, bit by bit, we're able to add direct forensic evidence that we're capturing now live from the bottom of the ocean, three and a half miles down that adds to the historical record. In some cases, it confirms it. In some cases, it modifies it. In some cases, direct physical evidence can refute the historical record. But what we're seeing here is a very clear sense that the officer, the commanding officer of U.S. Historic Town had a very clear view of what was happening to their ship as they fought in this battle and ultimately helped win the day while losing your town. Jim, there's your catwalk. Jim, what do you think? Look, Phil, say what you just did. Well, you know, we were looking, Mike, at that um, rake piece of debris, right, that's just hovering above the edge of the flight deck. Um, not just it's the same piece of debris that's sort of raked further aft and perhaps a little bit larger, but it's, uh, it's a great kind of geographical landmark to understand the vertical impact and damage damage potential and reality that that torpedo had. Likely it's related, and we also saw um, buckling, of, uh, buckling of plating and, um, you know, and, 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 and damage to the catwalk and also around the edge of the flight deck in this area, which likely was related to that torpedo attack as well. And the other thing is that, you know, it's also, it's something that you've seen in the photograph in photographs, in some cases, there it's a real action shot, so it's grainy, and it's hard to get the scale. And sometimes, just given the angle it's taken, it you get a very different sense of it than what we're seeing now. But it comes back to it's you are here, kind of a, a, a moment right. where, from a historic photograph, suddenly you you know where you're at, and you in that way connect to that path there. Right and have all the time to explore, you know? Yeah. So, the damage from the 80s would be coming up right to the left of that entry. Okay. Did you guys hear Alexis? He says the damage to frame 80 should be coming up to the left. You're moving along just past the center. Yeah, we're going to get the ship moving again. We're just in the middle of a watch change, so stand by one sec. I'm going to... Oh, it's uh, all good. We're... Yeah, right Mike, a nice slow view is perfect. I'm going to um, drop it back down here, Mike, to where we were and kind of get 
situated. Yep, yeah, sounds on good. The heading and all that. The yep. ship's uh, static right now, so. Yep, sounds good. Thank you. Go off the line here and uh, hand it over to the next watch. Thanks, everyone. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Dan, thank you. Going to be unmuted. This is edit video. I'm going to take this watch change opportunity to just get a feel for what my camera is doing and capable of. Gotcha. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to be handing off navigation to Derek. Uh, it was a pleasure working with you all and getting to see the Yorktown uh, firsthand. Thank you, Starfish. Thank you. Hello and welcome to all of our viewers that are joining us. I can't hear you. Mm. Hello, good morning, and welcome to all of our viewers that are joining us. Um, are y'all able to hear me okay? Uh, you're very low. Let me uh, finish this task here and I'll work on... Where are you at? Which I'm position? sitting next to Malia and uh, I don't know what this... Are you in the back row? Yeah. Are you at the work table? Or back are you row at the little work table. Work table. One or two? One? The top one? Top one, yes. Over here. Try that. Thank you. Does that sound better? Uh, yeah, I still need to come up. Oh, sure. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, maybe Let's try uh, 90. Testing, testing, one, two. There you go. How's that? Able to hear me? Okay. That's when we have, what about? Oh, is it? Yep, two, to hear you. Two. Uh, all right. That should be better. Awesome. Thank you, Ed. Mahalo, Ed. Yeah. Um, to all of our viewers that are joining us, or maybe you've been watching throughout this dive, uh, this is our third dive on Expedition NA-154. The name of this expedition is Ala Au Moana Kai Uli, and the four to eight watches just getting settled in into the control van, and uh, I just want to acknowledge how special this dive is and just uh, how special it feels to be part of this and that it's a privilege and an honor to be viewing the USS Yorktown with all of you right now. Um, I also want to acknowledge how special of a place this is. We are diving within the Papahanao Mokwake Marine National Monument, um, which are very sacred waters to Kanaka O'ivi, Native Hawaiians. And once everyone's kind of settled in, I wanted to pass it around for some introductions in the van. Um, Malia, are you you ready for an introduction, maybe? I am, yes. Can you folks hear me okay? Here you're good. You're good, okay. All right, so um, aloha, everyone. Um, happy for all of those that are able to join us um, from shore. And um, just so, you know, as we look at this shipwreck and the, the, um, the lives that were last, that were lost um, during this battle of Midway, we just really reflect on the um, enormity of it all. Um, we just, um, I myself feel very kaumaha. Kaumaha is like a very deep heaviness when there is, you know, such a large loss of life. Mm -hmm. And so um, just in it, that very sure. um, space but of hey, uh, reverence, yeah, um, remembering the, right. the tragedy really of war. And so um, my name is Malia Evans. I work for Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. 
and i um, just happy to be here and be able to share the story and um, the eyes, you know, that we have in the ocean in Kanaloa and in the sacred realm of Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Uh, this is a place that is very sacred. We consider it as Kanaka Iwi, the Aina Akua, the place where our ancestors dwell, the place where our Akua, our gods dwell. And so it is a place that creates, is a yeah, genesis yeah, yeah, yeah. of life for Native Hawaiians, so but I also the place myself, of death it, uh, where our souls return to after death. So just a very sacred place and, um, you know, it's it's yeah, not it on 10 till I zero it. Um, unusual to be here looking at this shipwreck and to know that they are safely, those that are on board this ship are safely in the realm of Po. You know, this is a place where our ancestors well, and um, now these um, World War II um, people who have passed. So it is a even more sacred now. Another layer of sacredness has been added to this area. So aloha to all of you, and thank you for joining us today. Yes, thank you, Malia, so much for that beautiful, beautiful introduction. Um, I also realized that I did not uh, share my name or my role. Uh, my name is Tori Hunt, and I'm a science communication fellow that is sitting watch during this four to eight shift. And I just want to echo all of the amazing just things that Malia just bit. shared with us. So um, and yes. we can throw it down to Hannah. Are you ready for an introduction? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. OK, awesome. Hi, I'm Hannah Parody. I am a science, my role on this ship is scientist and I am a geologist. And I feel honored and privileged to be a part of this expedition. So yeah, I'll just keep it short and sweet. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Hannah, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm Mike Brennan, uh, still here. <laughs> what, three watches later? Oh, wow. Um, Leads co-lead scientist, uh, maritime archaeologist with Search, um, and yeah, happy to be here. Awesome, thanks, Mike. Hi, Hans van Tilburg. I'm a maritime archaeologist with NOAA Sanctuaries Office. Still here as well. Sebastian. Hey everyone, I'm Sebastian Martinez. Um, I'm an undergraduate at University of Hawaii Manila, and I am today's data logger. One more time. I'm very happy to be here to experience this historic moment. Yeah, thank you, Sebastian. Um, front row, are we ready up there maybe for some introductions when you have a chance? Uh, yeah, this is Derek Sowers, um, serving as a navigator. I work for Ocean Exploration Trust as the mapping operations manager. Thank you, Hi, this is Alberto Calacious Jr. Everyone calls me Tito. I'm a regular employee at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute as chief pilot and expedition leader with Jason and uh, out here moonlighting with uh, Nautilus. I'm Dan with the ROV team. I'm off watch. Video. <laughs> nice. Dan is everywhere. And our, um, our, our scientists and archaeologists that are on shore, would you like to introduce yourselves? Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to, to keep exploring with everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Hartmeyer. I'm a marine archaeologist at NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. I'm joined here by, uh, by colleagues and professionals from different agencies to support it's a multi-agency, interagency, collaborative effort um, led by Ocean Exploration Trust, funded by NOAA Ocean Exploration via the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute, um, and certainly only possible with this caliber, caliber of professionalism uh, in archaeology with, uh, with the colleagues both on the ship, on shore, and around the world. And I'll talk to uh, my colleagues here around the room. This is Jim Delgado. I'm the Senior Vice President of Search, Inc. We're the largest archaeology company uh, in the United States, and we work in a variety of projects, and I have a colleague of Mike Brennan who's on board. Uh, I'm one of the co-leads 
for onshore science and archaeology and happy to be here with a team of colleagues from various agencies and other organizations, including three colleagues from Japan who have not yet called in but I know are watching, which is our, you know, Akafumi Iwabuchi, Jun Kimura, and Randall Sasaki. We also have colleagues from the Defense POW MIA Accounting Command, Megan Slider Munden, Hannah uh, Fleming. We also have uh, colleagues from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management joining us, including Bert Ho and Geneva Wright, and others uh, that come from outside groups, uh, nonprofit groups, such as Russ Matthews, E.D. Mark Tiho from the come Air, just a little the bit Heritage to Foundation. Get rid of but the sediment and get a little bit more of the Very data. importantly, oh. here in the UCC with us are our colleagues from the Navy's History and Heritage Command, and over to them. Hi, my name is Frank Thompson. I'm the Assistant Director Acting for Collection Management. Um, I oversee the um, archaeological program. Uh, I have one branch head is with us, um, Dr. Alexis Sambis. Honored and privileged to be part of this expedition um, and learning and providing, learning about the, the wreck and more about the Battle of Midway. And um, Alexis, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Alexis Pitt-Cambis. I head the uh, Naval History and Heritage Command Underwater Archaeology Branch. Uh, we are responsible for uh, managing, researching, and interpreting the Navy's uh, shipwrecks and aircraft wrecks. Uh, this is a particularly important site to the U.S. Navy. And we are very, uh, feel very privileged uh, and very pleased to be part of this partnership that Ocean Exploration Trust and NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration has made possible. Back to you. Well, we thank all of you for your expertise um, and sharing that uh, story of the Battle of Midway with all of our viewers. So mahalo nui from Hawaii. Yes, thank you all so much for um, being here and sharing all of your knowledge with us regarding the Battle of Midway. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we have Dr. Ballard with us viewing our live stream, and uh, he's telling us that he's in the command center in Egypt with Dr. Larry Meyer. And Ed, I don't think you had a chance earlier to introduce yourself, if you have a second now. Uh, just Ed, video. Just Ed, okay. Nice. Um, can someone either on shore or uh, here in the van with us kind of share a little bit about what are we looking at right now? Yeah, we're, um, we, we came down uh, about eight hours ago on the, uh, right on the stack of Yorktown and uh, moved off site found the went forward to the bow and then we did a, a couple of survey lines uh one along the deck edge and now we're coming back along the uh the mud line looking for the torpedo damage we saw a few minutes ago the torpedo damage from um one of the strikes and we're looking there's one more that'll be forward a little bit like around frame 72 or so so we're going to be actually i might it might be right up there um so we're doing that and then we're going to uh, come back along the flight deck. So we, we're taking a look at some of the battle damage um, from Yorktown. So Yorktown was struck multiple times, uh, initially by a uh, aerial bomb from a, a plane, uh, then aerial torpedoes, which we just were seeing the damage of here on the port side. Uh, and then it was um, torpedoed again, uh, but by a submarine this time uh, a day later. And that was on the starboard side and that's what eventually sank it. Um, so we're, we're just looking at the port side forward, uh, as we head towards the bow. Um, Derek, are we ready to, uh, get moving? Uh, looks like we're still moving. Oh, we are. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're just, uh, going very slowly, um, forward along the wreck and we're looking for um, the second torpedo set of torpedo damage, um, which should be along the mud line. It's actually possible that it, we have a mound of mud there. It could be buried under yep. um, some of the sediment too. Yeah, if we can see it. Yeah. Um, once we get to the bow, we're gonna. I want to take a minute and do a, a scan with the uh, with the sonar and see. There was a target out there that we might move over to real quick and see what it is. 
uh, before continuing up to the flight deck. Mike, I, our concern is that we drifted, with the shift change, we drifted past the second torpedo hull. Uh, I don't... It, I don't all, you it think? could be buried. Yeah, I, I, I was watching the whole time. I didn't see anything that looked like it. I don't think we've moved all that far. Would they be able to pan up, Mike, uh, just a hair so that we can look at what structure is above there and correlate it with frame? Sorry, what was that? Can you repeat that? If we can come up, we can uh, orient ourselves to the uh, Oh, yeah. What's I think the we're... the next move that you would like to see? Hmm. Well, hold on. Can we just uh, come up a little bit so that we can orient ourselves on the ship? Uh, coming up a wee bit. And should I uh, face the vessel a little bit more? Yeah, yes, please. We might be here. Yeah. We might be at the very... Uh, the aft end of the uh, forward hangar door. Hangar open? No way. Is that a hangar door opening? Would you hangar door. like me to keep coming up? Or? Um, a little bit more, yeah. And that looks like, is that damaged? That ladder and all the stuff underneath that? Well, just look, look, look at that thing here. There's a davit. <clears throat> so, what do you see there? Do you see one opening on the right? There it is. That's helpful. Yeah. Oh, remember, we were saying, like, maybe that's that giant ID. That's the edge of the salvage yeah. gun tubs. Yeah. We're close to the bow. Right. So, Opening on the left I've is right so above. Right. Yeah, thank you. And, and there looked to be damage, concussion damage. Yeah. Right. So, Mike, we're at about frame 70. So okay. we're in an area where, so we did go past it a bit, but that's. Yeah, it, it was buried, it looked. Yeah, I think it is buried. Yeah. But it's interesting that we are seeing, we're seeing distortion in the hull here. Yeah. Uh, all right, Tita, we can, we're we're can we're go back. We're about 508 large no it's okay i mean i we watched it it's it's buried in the mud yeah tita we can go back down now roger that thank you please let me know when you're uh, happy with the altitude yep and i think i think about 11 meters was was good 11 or 12. okay and uh heading back to about 45 on the vessel yes please it is yeah, I think we're aft edge of the forward hangar door. Yep. So how do they we're unload? Ready for another ship at when you are. Did they have a complimentary? You know? We've been doing 35 meter steps at a heading of a bearing of 35 degrees towards the bow if we want to continue that trend I yeah know, that works i know it could be random mike but you know there's a line with a loop in it over the port side and where they were getting things off so oh yeah that that could have been used in some way for lowering things yep all right that's right around 11 meters sounds good And I'm just going to throw this out there. I'm a U.S. Navy veteran, and I sailed and recommissioned the U.S. Uh, Iowa down in Pascagoula, Mississippi, and sailed on it for about a year. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that with us, Tito. Um, I know I've talked with you a little bit about your experience in the Navy before, 